Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. This week, we're bringing you an interview with Lord Robert Skidelsky. Here's the conversation, which begins with Robert reading a letter that Keynes wrote to Hayek about the road to serfdom. My dear Hayek, the voyage has given me the chance to read your book properly. In my opinion, it's a grand book. We all have the greatest reason to be grateful to you for saying so well what needs um, so much to be said. You will not expect me to accept quite all the economic dicta in it, but morally and philosophically, I find myself in agreement with virtually the whole of it, and not only in agreement with it, but in a deeply moved agreement. Turning to a few special points, I think you strike the wrong note on page 69, where you deprecate all the talk about plenty just round the corner. No doubt this is partly due to my having a different view to yours about the facts. But apart from this, would it not be more in line with your general argument to, to urge that the very f fact of the economic problem being more on its way to solution than it was a generation ago is in itself a reason why we are better to afford economic sacrifices, if indeed economic sacrifices are required in order to secure non-economic advantages? It seems to me that it is in this particular matter, above all, that the communist doctrine is so desperately out of date, at least in its application to the United States and Western Europe. They ask us to concentrate on economic conditions more exclusively than in any other period in the world's history, precisely at the moment when, by their own showing, technical achievement is making this sacrifice increasingly unnecessary. This preoccupation with the economic problem is brought to its most intense at a phase in our evolution when it is becoming ever less necessary. The line of argument you yourself take depends on the very doubtful assumption that planning is not more efficient. Quite likely, from the purely economic point of view, it is efficient. That is why I say it would be more in line with your general argument to point out that even if the extreme planners can claim their technique to be the most efficient, nevertheless technical achievement even in a less planned community is so considerable that we do not today require the superfluous sacrifice of liberties which they themselves would admit to have some value. One point which perhaps you might have pressed further is the tendency today to disparage the profit motive while still depending on it and putting nothing in its place. The passage about this on page 97 is very good indeed. Could not be better, but I would like to have seen this theme a little more expanded. On the moral issue, I also find the last paragraph on page 156 is extraordinarily good and fundamental. I come finally to what is really my only serious criticism of the book. You admit here and there that it is a question of knowing where to draw the line. You agree that the line has to be drawn somewhere and that the logical extreme is not possible. But you give us no guidance whatever as to where to draw it. In a sense, this is shirking the practical issue. It is true that you and I would probably draw it in different places. I should guess that according to my ideas, you greatly underestimate the practicability of the middle course. But as soon as you admit that the extreme is not possible and that a line has to be drawn, you are on your own argument done for. Since you are trying to persuade us that so soon as one moves an inch in the planned direction, you are necessarily launched on the slippery slope which will lead you in due course over the precipice. I should therefore conclude your theme rather differently. I should say that what we want is not no planning or even less planning. Indeed, I should say that we almost certainly want more. But the planning should take place in a community in which as many people as possible, both leaders and followers, wholly share your own moral position. Moderate planning will be safe if those carrying it out are rightly oriented in their own minds and hearts to the moral issue. This is, in fact, already true of some of them.
but the curse is that there is also an important section who would almost be said to want planning not in order to enjoy its fruits, but because morally they hold ideas exactly the opposite of yours and wish to serve not God, but the devil. Reading the New Statesman and Nation, one sometimes feels that those who write there while they cannot safely oppose moderate planning, are really hoping in their hearts that it won't, will not succeed, and so prejudice more violent action. They fear that if moderate measures are sufficiently successful, this will al allow a reaction in what you think the right and they think the wrong moral direction. Perhaps I do them an injustice, but perhaps I do not. What we need, therefore, in my opinion, is not a change in our economic programs, which would only lead in practice to disillusion with the results of your philosophy, but perhaps even the contrary, namely an enlargement of them. Your greatest danger ahead is the probable practical failure of the application of your philosophy in the United States in a fairly extreme form. No, what we need is the restoration of right moral thinking, a return to proper moral values in our social philosophy. If only you could turn your crusade in that direction, you would not look or feel quite so much like Don Quixote. I accuse you of perhaps confusing a little bit the moral and the material issues. Dangerous acts can be done safely in a community which thinks and feels rightly, which would be the way to hell if they were executed by those who think and feel wrongly. So you say in the paper that you wrote about this that Hayek called Keynes a great man but not a great economist, while Keynes thought the rule to serfdom, as you, wrote, as you just read, was a great grand book, but he thought little of Hayek's economics. I think we have a lot to explore today. I agree. Thank you. I um, often say that economics uh, called forth INET, and our job is to, it's, is to use Charles Dickens, uh, it's the tale of two failed romances. <laughs> One is the ideal free market, unfettered, will deliver us from evil, and the other is the romance that the state will fix it. Yeah. I worked in government too long with the Senate Banking and Budget Committees in America to ever believe that the state is that uh, perfect. Well, the state can't fix everything, but it can fix some things. Well, there's, there's that, a role for each, yeah, for the market. Yes, of course as, there is. And, and, they're, and they're both tools as a means to an end. They aren't the end in themselves, which I think is part of the confusion in recent years. I know, I'm, but you, and, and I think... I think the two extremes are really, I suppose, the, the, the market, the unfettered market, and on the other side, central planners. Yes. A central That's planning. Right. Those are the two extremes. And uh, uh, I, I always think of Keynes as the middle way, mm -hmm. that he mm -hmm. said, no, you don't have to choose. And, it, you know, there are limited interventions that can improve the working of the market mm -hmm. and at the same time avoid... Excessive uh, state. Uh, excessive yeah. state. Mm -hmm. And that's, what, that's we've what's got to, this, what's what we've got to hold on to. Yeah, and this uh, letter from Keynes focused on the road to serfdom, which he sent to Hayek, really, in, in a very concise way, gets right into those issues. Yes, he read, he read, um, he read the road to serfdom on the way um, to the United States uh, where he was um, uh, taking part in, in, in the Bretton Woods Conference. Mm -hmm. And so the road to serfdom came out um, in June 1944. Keynes read it on board ship, and he dashed off this letter. Uh, four-page letter to Hayek and said something rather un, un, you know, unexpected. He said, this is a great book and I find myself in deep, deeply moved agreement with it. Yep. Then he said, but... Yeah. And the whole thing starts with the butts. Yes. There were I think, three butts. You could make out four butts actually, uh -huh. but I, uh, and one of them, and the first, the first important butt was, well, you say that um, um, it, it, you know uh, that that any intervention is the thin end of the wedge and the slippery slope to uh, mm -hmm. to central planning, and, and Keynes says in his letter, he says, no, it's the inoculation against it. Moderate planning mm -hmm. is the inoculation against the extreme 
um, extreme uh, so I guess version let, let, of let me, the disease. Let uh, me see if I understand. That if you have an extreme free market and the people in the bottom, which could be many or a few, become despairing, Keynes's middle way is designed to take the sting out of that and what you might call allow the wisdom of crowds to prevail rather than the madness of crowds to rise up and affect how a very good way of putting it you can also put it as a, uh, in the terms of an inoculation mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, a mild form of the disease actually prevents the full full blown variety from developing i mean one's got to think of this was this debate took place in 1944 and one of the extraordinary things about the road to serfdom is it never mentions the great depression mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and in fact, of course, the madness of crowds was very evident in the rise in the share of the vote to the Nazis mm-hmm. between 1928 and 1933. Yes. just shot up. Yes. And then, um, of course, it shot up because um, a quarter of the German uh, workforce was out of work. Yes. Uh, and, and, and Hayek never mentions that. And he, he attributed the rise of the Nazis to the hyperinflation in the years preceding the, the Depression. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so the whole bias of um, Hayek and, and, in fact, Friedman and others have followed in, in, um, in, in, in his footsteps has always been to attach much more importance to the dangers of inflation than the dangers of um, unemployment, mm-hmm. whereas, in fact, a sensible uh, view would be, well, you want to avoid both. Mm-hmm. Uh, but mm-hmm. if you had to choose um, between having half half your half your workforce out of work and uh, and, and and some some inflation at any rate, you choose you, you you allow the inflation, but you don't have to choose. That's you shouldn't have to choose. Well, I, let me introduce uh, what you might call class into this. Very wealthy people don't suffer in a downturn because they have a reservoir of wealth they can draw upon. They do suffer from inflation. Yeah. If they are disproportionately powerful, yeah. as in the case of the United States where money in politics is so prevalent, we can be in a place where suffering for the many is the result because mm-hmm. the survival of politicians depends upon serving the few. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so I think there, how would I say, there are all kinds of ways in which things can come unraveled. But... Uh, I think Keynes at the time, and it, while he was, and you point this out in your in your essay, he was more of a kind of elite Oxford Cambridge person. Hayek viewed himself more on the outside. Mm-hmm. When I first read that, by the way, it scared me because it felt to me like Hayek was on the outside representing something that the plutocrats would like, and it looked like Donald Trump to me a little bit. Yeah. That uh, not not him in, in terms of his intellect or the texture of his sophistication, but the ramifications of an outsider talking about inflation felt uh, how like he had a blind spot towards one of the things that could lead to an authoritarian government, which I- is the disenfranchisement of the many and the despair that results, and that feels like much closer to our problem today. Yeah. Uh, a, hu- a huge blind spot. I, I think. I think you can understand it in personal terms. He was came from Vienna. His fa- family was middle class. They lost a lot of money. Um, mm-hmm. and they lost a lot of their wealth in the Great Inflation. It was a mm-hmm. hyperinflation, by the so, way. So, yeah. And 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 also, he was never never part of a governing. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, yeah. Never part of a governing class, really, mm-hmm. which Keynes was. It was the English tradition yeah. that um, the ruling class actually had um, both intellectual and, if you might, traditional elements in it. The brightest um, people from Oxford and Cambridge went into the civil service, mm-hmm. um, and they were part of the government. And Keynes was always, um, I think they called it uh, the term clerisy really ah, uh, ah, really yes. sums it up <laughs> they they felt a responsibility for governing not just for producing ideas mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, I think Keynes fits very much into that pattern whereas Hayek he was always on the outside he uh, events circumstances and of course his personality mm-hmm. um, I don't think mm-hmm. Hayek would ever have been a, a, a great administrator uh, or w- would have seen that as his role whereas Keynes was a very very powerful administrator mm-hmm. as well as um, a theorist, and he mm-hmm. spent two important years of his uh, periods of his life in the Treasury. Mm-hmm. One of the interesting things toward the end of Keynes' letter to Hayek, 
He's how he breathes the need for moral and ethical consideration, not only into the decision making, but into how the public understands the basis for decision making. And he saw that as a way of resisting the run to authoritarian, uh, how would I say, the, the polar fear of central planning and authoritarian rule that, that Hayek worried about. Yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's quite a difficult passage in the letter where he talks about that. I mean, he says, for example, dangerous acts can be um, safely done in a, in, in a society that thinks and feels uh, rightly, which would be the road to hell um, in a society that thinks and feels wrongly. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a, a, an interesting idea because uh, it, what it suggests is that if you have a liberal tradition, um, in 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 the society, then you can do certain things which don't um, lead to hell, because w which they would in other societies which lacked um, a liberal and moral basis. And um, and and a number of American critics of Hayek pointed out that um, this 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 is why there wouldn't be. A, 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 a road to serfdom from adopting, say, a, a Keynes, mm -hmm. certain uh, mm -hmm. certain um, types of intervention, um, and, and and that's a powerful argument. But but um, as I think I um, what I think is it's a static argument because um, if you do too many dangerous acts, so to speak, then you lose the idea of what it is to. To why they're dangerous, mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. start accepting things which you know twenty or thirty years ago you wouldn't have dreamt. Yes. Um, and and yes. one example of that is we we, we accept degrees of surveillance now. Yeah, oh, which yeah. which um, you know a few a few years back would have been regarded as intolerable infringements of our liberty, personal mm -hmm. liberty. But now we we accept them. Yeah. Um, and so they, they invoke terrorism and the need to monitor invoke, to protect exactly. you by surveillance. Exactly. As the so we just basis. we just yeah. accept that, and we get into Orwellian George Orwell territory, yes. where yes. we accept that Big Brother has some rights um, over us because uh, Big Brother ha has manufactured threats. Some of the threats are real, some of them are manufactured. Yes. Uh, one, of the, one of the concerns that I have, we talked a little bit about Hayek's blind spot. Keynes is much more comfortable with administration. He appears to me to project a goodness onto administration in the middle path that may or may not be a valid uh, projection. It might have been in his heart, but it might not be something that what we might call uh, is there in all weather with yeah. all people sitting in the captain's chair. And that particularly concerns me in the United States right now because when I watch Trump voters, I, as you probably know, I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and I watch the cynicism that the people in Detroit had vis-a-vis -vis the Clinton family, NAFTA, then uh, criminal justice reform and welfare reform, and then the Obama administration come in and do the bank bankruptcy bailout of the auto companies, but allow them to use the money to build plants in places like China and Mexico, allegedly. I don't know if that ever happened. But the distrust of the middle liberals in America, where with their advanced degrees and their elite degrees and their alleged do-gooding, these people felt their ship was sinking. Yeah. And I don't know if I trust from my own lens of experience that the elites in America, in the center, are sensitive enough to the lower realms, and I'm not talking about 5% of the population, I'm talking to 50% of the population. Yeah, well, of course, I think um, this was this was uh, Milton Friedman's big criticism of Keynes. I had once had a conversation with him about this, and he said, of course, Keynes was a great economist, but he, but he grew up in England, not in the United States. Had he been an American, he wouldn't have quite um, come to the views about the, the, the benevolence of intervention, because mm -hmm. he would have seen the American. Um, pork barrel politics and 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 um, administration in action and he would have realized that you can't trust these people yeah. uh, and, and 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 that was that was an important criticism but then you still had the problem you can't then because you couldn't trust the governors assume that the problems they said they were going you know wanted to solve didn't exist 
um, like the instability of, uh, of, of economies. And I think the task um, we face today, now that fiscal policy is starting to come back, um, and everyone now is talking about well, what sort of macroeconomics should we now have. Mm-hmm. We've, we've got to um, confront this this um, uh, issue. There are these instabilities, and we can't really, um, we don't feel we can trust the discretion of the politicians because they're always going to be hungry for votes and they'll mismanage all this. Yeah. How can we find a more automatic way, if you like? Well, they may of, be hungry getting, for votes or they may hung, be hungry for money as a means or to. Or money as a means to. Use public relations and media to garner votes. Yeah. Right? So votes are the ultimate currency, but how do you achieve them is. Is difficult to comprehend, and and I think I think um, the the key is to make the interventions more automatic and less discretionary, mm-hmm. so that when certain uh, indications of say downturn mm-hmm. happen, some automatic stabilizers go into action, yes. and it's not the politicians changing taxes or increasing their spending; they they just happen automatically. And I mm-hmm. think that's the challenge to devise a macroeconomic yeah. policy that. You see, they thought they could do it through independent central banks and that these would be neutral, they'd be technical, and they'd, be, they'd, uh, they'd operate on purely technical criteria. And in fact, that they turned out not to be neutral, and they yes. also turned out yes. to be too weak well, to do the job. Well, my good friend, uh, the late William Grider, who died on Christmas Day, used to say to me, independence from whom? <laughs> and I think that's a fundamental question. That's a fundamental question, and and I think monetary policy is 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 um, is, is shown to be too weak to do the things that um, uh, um, people like Hayek and 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 Friedman thought that was all that was necessary for it to do. Yeah, I think the uh, presumption that the velocity of money is stable yeah. is a little bit uh, disproven by experience. Stable and, demand for money. And, that, and, that's and, Friedman, isn't it? Yeah, but and I, Hayek. I do, I and do Hayek. agree yeah. that monetary policy in the experience of moderate to high inflation can restrain that. It, it, it is an effective tool. But when interest rates are close to zero like they are now, you're not going to push on a string, as Keynes said, yeah. and get out of the ditch. You know, there's a big debate on whether monetary policy did, in fact, um, uh, um, uh, was, in fact, responsible for the good inflation results before 2008. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of research that suggests it was much more structural, structural features. Structural supply side innovation. Y- yeah. yeah. I know the, the Japanese the, very strongly believe yeah, that. Uh, yeah, and not, not the central bankers. Mm-hmm. Um, there's another issue, I think, that's terribly important in 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 um in um the the Keynes Hayek um, discussion of 1944, and when Keynes accuses Hayek of of um he says where do you draw the line? I mean, as soon as you allow s- some sorts of interventions, I mean, you don't tell us when when to stop. This is Keynes to Hayek. At least I have a limited. I have a limited objective, but you talk generally about the the imp- supreme importance of the rule of law, but Keynes is implying law can, laws can be very coercive. They can fulfil the Hayekian criterion and still be extremely coercive. Encroach upon freedom. Yeah, yeah. In many I mean, ways, for example, yeah. Hayek endorsed conscription. Yes. I mean, a, a perfectly yes. general rule. I mean, it applies to everyone. It doesn't discriminate against any groups. So it is fulfills his definition of a good law, but it can be very, very coercive, and you can think of many others. So Keynes is really saying to Hayek, well, where, where, where do you stop, really? You say, Keynes says to Hayek, you say that I'm the slippery slope, but you are actually on a slippery slope yourself, yes. because you don't define what, what the uh, inalienable rights uh, of individuals yeah. are. Where, where can rules impinge and where are they uh, yeah. in violation of a deeper moral framework? And, 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 yeah. and what Hayek says, which is a real giveaway, I think, um, in, in the Constitution of Liberty, he said, if we had an omniscient planner, there'd be very little case for liberty. <laughs> he says that, you see. So it's all, it's all contingent on information deficits. Mm-hmm. If, we, if we could overcome the information deficit, yes. then we wouldn't need markets. We wouldn't, yes. need, we wouldn't need any freedoms um, uh, in, in the economy at all. Yeah, but I, I mentioned to you earlier today that uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, Joseph Stiglitz introduced me to the notion of Hayek's that 
the market is an information machine. It reveals, it discovers, it signals to us and becomes a part of discovery of what society needs. And I always had a very hard time digesting that because I'd say if you massively under-provide public goods, the market will tell you through its price signals all kinds of the wrong things to do. It yeah. won't diagnose the problem, mm -hmm. and it will leave you on a lower trajectory than would be feasible for mankind if it could envision the proper infrastructure and public goods. Well, I think that was a powerful argument, and Hayek didn't really have any public goods in his system. Yeah. Um, and uh, therefore, he didn't take into account the fact that um, uh, you, you, we weren't pricing properly a whole mm -hmm. lot of the economy. He just assumed that if you had a, uh, a market, you'd uh, market in everything, you would um, you would um, get the correct relative pricing, but you can't have a market in everything. Yes. I mean, um, you know, there aren't markets in some things, mm -hmm. uh, which which are which are which are pretty important. Futures markets, and I mean, all yeah. kinds of uh, financial markets, they don't yet exist, and so you could get all kinds of things going wrong. Um, but he never took that into account, and 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 that's why really um, he 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 took a logical position um, in the light of his theory, which was politically intolerable, which is when you have a depression, when, you know, he, he, the system goes wrong, um, according to his own um, uh, views, which is too much money is printed and that distorts it's, prices. It's a you, collapse. You, you mustn't yeah. intervene. Yeah. You mustn't intervene because what you must do is you must let the economy collapse in order to eliminate these malinvestments mm -hmm. that have been financed by credit and not by genuine s savings. Mm -hmm. Well, fancy saying that in 1931 or 32. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, it's, it was Almost politically like a, crazy. It was politically yeah. crazy. I'm told that he later sort of modified that position, but it does follow very, very directly from his theory about the causes of slumps. Oh, and the depth and duration of slumps is not uh, a, a couple months. <laughs> no. It can, it can be prolonged. It can be decades. It can destroy many, many lives so that, how would I say, the, the temptation to human action is not to sit and watch things cleanse for a decade because somebody made errors 20 yeah, years yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. A generation is lost and the economy right. is uh, weakened for years ahead. But he was still, despite his apparent retraction on this point, he was still saying the same sort of thing in 1981. He, there was a... I remember an article he wrote in in um, in the in the Times newspaper in about 1979, 1980, and the Conservatives had just announced a gradual disinflation strategy mm -hmm. over five years. Hayek said, "No, this is never going to work. What you've got to do is you've got to cut the issue of money right now, stone dead. Mm -hmm. Fifty percent of the workforce will be out of work." but it's a price we have to pay. And it, it won't last long. It'll only, they'll only be out of work for six months. And then, mm, mm. But fancy, fancy saying that, I mean, really. I mean, <laughs> what, what, world, what world was he inhabiting? So he was a great man, but there, there, were, there were these, these mm. blind spots. Well, let, me, let me take the other side for Hayek for a moment. Looking at the present circumstance in the United States, he talked about the slippery slope of you know, and you you talked about the need for things more than monetary policy, fiscal, and I would also call it the equivalent of structural or industrial policy have come back onto the radar. But people are frightened of industrial policy. People in America look at the military industrial complex spending about a trillion and a half dollars, including nuclear stuff in the energy department, so-called black budgets, intelligence budgets, and the defense budget, and they look at the tattered infrastructure, dreadful schools, pensions being canceled, and so forth, isn't the size and scale of the American military and their influence on the political process the kind of thing that Hayek was warning against? Well, I wonder. You see, I mean, uh, you go back to Adam Smith, <clears throat> who says uh, defense is more important than opulence. So if you can justify 
huge expenditures on defense in, in, in terms of national security. People will buy that who won't buy equivalent expenditures on schools and hospitals. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know... Uh, it's a hierarchy yeah. of needs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. and Americans have always been prepared to accept, accept budget deficits, huge budget deficits, mm-hmm. actually, mm-hmm. for purposes of defense, which if they were incurred for... Uh, civil, civilian purposes would um, uh, uh, raise howls of outrage yes. and everyone going up and say the federal government's out of control and things like that. Um, and they'll even pay taxes, uh, higher taxes, if it's security. But that's And that was, of course, a, a way a lot of Keynesian policy operated in the 1950s right. and but 1960s. It, but it's also the question, is it defense or offense? Well, With the American military and large multinational corporations, a lot of the American public think that we're spending a lot of money as pork and we're spending a lot of money to fortify the earnings and balance sheets of large corporations. And it really isn't about threats to the continental United States. Well, governments have always been brilliant at manufacturing threats, in order yes. foreign threats, in order to justify what they're doing. This was the whole point of Orwell, yeah. 1984. There was a permanent war going on yes. Um, yes. Uh, between these three empires, mm-hmm. and, and, and that justified the degree of surveillance. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's also true. But, but I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not quite as against, um, well... There's a, there's a case for military spending not on on security grounds but for its spin-off effects mm-hmm. on the civilian economy and, and, and a number of economists it actually, innovation yeah yeah yes, a number yes, of economists yes. say that you know a whole lot of um, the c- c- civilian computer industry grew out of the uh, rand research mm-hmm. on on deterrence mm-hmm. in the 1950s and 1960s mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that's one argument internet be, silicon yeah. valley many of the things that are in the new information economy if you look, were spawned by the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the Defense Department. Yeah, and I mean, when I say spawned, funded by funded by S R and D, and yeah. they were the big procurers of these um, these these things. But is that do you have to do it that way? Mm-hmm. I mean, do you have to have um, large military expenditures in order to get any research yes. uh, or any any innovation? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, it, it it's it's an open question, it seems to me, because yeah. it's um. I mean, in a in a in a way, um, it, it 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 raises the question of why 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 you have a technical innovation anyway. Well, what yes. what what what, what drives so it? What is technical innovation designed to solve? Yeah. What what is its purpose? How does it augment society's well being? I know, you know, and there's a big debate on this. I mean, yes. some people say you don't get any innovation unless you have very secure property rights. You have a market, and then you have patent law, and then you get innovation. Mm-hmm. But in fact, the experience of countries has been not entirely it's supportive. It's partly sided. that. Well, they say there's mm-hmm. good and evil in everything. In a patent, <laughs> there is protection for the existing, and there is deterrent to the new challenger that could take you even further. And yeah. We're seeing a lot of that with the aggression of the lawyers that work for Silicon Valley firms that are already mega size, uh, how would I say, deterring and sometimes buying at half price startups that can't afford to joust with the deep pocketed uh, well, monopolies. Well, it's again, it's the assumption of a market. You see, all yeah. these good good effects yes. that people like Hayek um, um, are, 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 are saying, uh, are suggesting all. C- depend on very very great amount of competition mm-hmm. and it's of course he admits that mm-hmm. so he says the main task of government should be um, um, to um, attack monopoly and and and, mm-hmm. and prevent monopoly they talked about the, that form of planning the rules and enforcement that's set up to ensure competition and the yeah. Keynes and Hayek agreed on that based they, on the they letter. agreed on that yeah. and and although Hayek was marginalized for years in the anglo-american economies he wasn't marginalized in the German economy, mm-hmm. and ordo liberalism yes. was yes. very was influenced by Hayek, mm-hmm. um, and 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 that then that influence fed into the way the European Union was constructed. Mm-hmm. So we also have an Anglo-American bias in the way we think about uh, uh, economics. Well, I remember reading the histories that Phil Morawski and others did of the Mount Pelerin Society, and how people like Frank Knight. And Hayek were marginalized, and uh, Simons was, uh, was it Henry Simons? Henry Simons. Were marginalized because the people who funded the Mount Pelerin Society, it was called the Volcker 
Foundation from the Midwestern United States yeah. seem not to want to address the question of monopolies. They would yeah. address the question of labor unions, yeah. but not monopolies. But Hayek um, is also na- a bit naive here, I think, because he thought you wouldn't have a monopoly unless the government, um, unless the government uh, created and supported it. Mm-hmm. He thought all monopolies mm-hmm. were were really state. Um, creations. And that was true in much of Central Europe and, and historically. But of course, it's not a question of, of of one creating the other. It's a symbiosis between big business and big government yes. Um, yes. Uh, that really produces this. And if the same people are in the government and also head, head, heading the large monopolies, who is to, how can you say, well, it's rather empty then to say that yes. monopolies are the creation of the state yes. and they wouldn't exist without no, it. it. Which it, the arrows go in both directions. The arrows go in both and what directions. Ken Galbraith called the countervailing powers of organized labor and their voting power. When they don't exist, it becomes a, a two way game rather than a three part three three party part. negotiation. And, and, and I think one of the problems today is certainly all over the Western world, we've emasculated the third bit oh, yes. and the trade unions are well, a shadow globalization and globalization, and which of course is why so many people were in favor of globalization, <laughs> which has achieved so exactly many influential people, influential numbers people. of people. Yeah. <laughs> as a numbers of people. <laughs> yes. yes. There's one other thing could I, I mean, I'd like to raise um, in, in, in this discussion because it's to do with um, the question of scarcity and abundance. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Hayek was a, was really he assumed scarcity was always going to be with us. He just he took that definition of economics. So it, economic efficiency then w- plays a much bigger much role in bigger well-being. Role yes. In well-being, whereas Keynes says yes, but of course we are moving into an era um, where you know we won't have to pay so much attention to efficiency. Therefore, therefore we don't actually need um, uh, planning either. Um, and, and he then says to Hayek, if you could, um, if you could um, launch your anti-planning crusade um, on a more moral basis, that in fact we have, um, we are in the course of solving our economic problems, and therefore we can actually revert to uh, the real basis of a, a moral uh, um, uh, outlook, which is how to live wisely, agreeably, and well. Mm-hmm. These are. Keynes's mm-hmm. term, then you wouldn't, you know, you you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be just arguing this in terms of economic efficiency and and which is more efficient than the other. You'd be able, in a position to say, well, actually, we don't need efficiency so much yes. in our part yes. of the world. Yes. We can think about other things. I, I and, uh, always admired Keynes' conscious awareness and articulation that the economy was a means to an end, not an end in itself, which is tantamount to saying that material well-being is a necessary condition at the foundation, but it is not all of what constitutes a good life. Exactly. And the difference was Hayek in The Road to Serfdom said, morality comes out of the pursuit of efficiency. And Keynes said, morality starts when Efficiency is no longer that important. That's right. You see, I, right. I think I think that there's there's a huge difference there, um, which um, again would have been the subject of a a great argument had they lived to have have it. Uh, what is the? Uh, I think towards the end of the letter, where he's talking about, uh, he says, "What we need, therefore." in my opinion, is not a change in our economic programs, which only lead in practice to disillusion with the results of your philosophy, perhaps on the contrary, namely an enlargement of the programs. Greatest danger ahead is probable practical failure of the application of your philosophy in the United States in a fairly extreme form. Now what we, we need is the restoration of right moral thinking, a return to proper moral value in our social philosophy. So Keynes, at some level, is asking Hayek to embed material conditions in a, a broader moral philosophy, yeah. not assume that material conditions constitute what you might call a sufficient condition for achieving moral goals. Yeah, I, I think, I think, um, I think. Th- Hayek would have 
probably agreed with that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, he was so um, so um, committed to... Um, you see, Hayek was trapped in a way uh, because um, economic efficiency, that's what the market promises. It promises much better economic efficiency than the um, uh, planning system. So that's what... So that's that's the ground on which he wants to fight planning, the ground of economic efficiency. Yes. And Keynes says, but look, there's a better ground for fighting planning if you get away from the economic efficiency argument. Planning really destroys um, the moral basis of, the, of, 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 of a society because it, 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 it destroys free choice, which is the, mm -hmm. the, the basis mm -hmm. of morality. And in a way, Hayek accepts that, but um, he can't quite say it. And in the end, he has a feeble defense of individual liberty, I think, because he then says, well, it depends. You have to have individual liberty because the planner doesn't know everything. Um, yes. But that's, uh, that's a very instrumental view of in individual liberty. It's a contingent view. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. the planner did know anything, you wouldn't need individual liberty. Yeah. And, 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 and Keynes says, <laughs> but that... That's that's wrong, of course. Yes. I mean, you, yes. you, 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 even if the planner does, even if the planner is omniscient, you still need to um, have a, a system in which you know your own moral choices affect the outcomes of things. Yes. Um, in other words, you have to have rights. So I think one way of putting it is it's a, it's a, it's an argument between a rights-based view of individual liberty mm -hmm. and Isaiah Berlin view, mm -hmm. if you like, and a yes. utilitarian view, which mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, um, liberty is useful. I, um, I, may, I may constrain you, but you'll be better off as a result of my vision and design being implemented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Which is kind of a paternalistic sensibility that, uh, how would I say, is not a lot of people have faith in today. I agree. They were both Whigs, you know, in the, yeah. in the, uh, um, in the uh, European sense, in that um, they 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 were neither con they neither none of them neither of them were conservatives, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they were reformers of a of a tradition. But then the question is, um, uh, well, I think you need them both. Actually, mm -hmm. if I if I had to if I had to sum it all up, I think there is a slippery slope, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you need intervention. And, 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 and the task is to get the intervention without the slippery slope. Yes. I remember uh, when I was young, I read a book by Kenneth Boulding, who lived in Colorado in the United know, States. Yeah. Yeah. And he said there are all of these debates about central planning, markets, and so forth. He said, we know we don't know everything. So I think having decentralized poles of influence and control is much better than concentrated because the scope for error and the responsiveness to adjustment f favors a system where some one entity's big errors can't destroy us yeah. all. And I, I thought that was, a how do they say, an, an interesting injection into the way to think about economics. And when I look at uh, both Hayek and Keynes, you can kind of see them oscillating in and out. I wanted to ask you about, uh, there's a gentleman, Jeffrey Mann, who is now a fellow at uh, the Institute for New Economic Thinking. He was with us in Azizi. Yeah. And yeah. Jeff wrote a book called, In the Long Run, They're All Dead. <laughs> His last chapter is called Revolution After Revolution. And what he said was this. When he came to look at social dynamics, this was roughly 2015, he was writing the book, he thought that Keynes' countercyclical macroeconomic policy took the pain out of the downturn in the business cycle and anesthetized the necessary political mobilization that was needed for structural reform inside mm -hmm. the economy. And if you did that over several business cycles, the inner structure would rot. But then he said he saw, after the 2016 election, Brexit, the AFD in Germany, Marie Le Pen, and others, again, that phrase, that the wisdom of crowds, the small-d democracy, might be a romantic fallacy, 
and the thrusts towards authoritarian nationalism, maybe Keynes was right, that the, if you allowed too much pain, you wouldn't get structural reform. Yeah. You'd get authoritarian craziness. Whereas when you anesthetize things, it allowed, which you might call the body politic, to be less despairing and stay on a more even keel. Yeah, yeah, of course. I think that's the that's the perennial debate. A small amount of anaesthetics, you see. Yes. But if yeah. it becomes total, then yeah. of course you you you, you become supine. Um, uh, no, but the the, the 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 debate goes on. I mean, you see, why I think that um, Keynes isn't isn't um, just countercyclical. Um, uh, it's that he really doesn't believe that his interventions are changing relative prices mm -hmm. because he doesn't believe the economy is normally achieving its full potential of production. Right. It's not a scarcity. It's, it's not it's a scarcity a, issue. It's a win-win game to you see, get back. Hayek will always say, look, yeah. if, you, if yeah. you have these interventions, you're distorting relative prices. Mm -hmm. Keynes said, not if you have underemployment, underemployed mm -hmm. resources. You lift everyone up together. He has this phrase, all the boats are lifted up together. You're not distorting anything. Yes. And at the same time, you're preventing possibly political catastrophe yes. um, um, in other words Keynes was saying to Hayek you're really treating the wrong disease <laughs> because you're not accepting the fact that, that yes. uh, an unmanaged economy doesn't actually you know maintains continuous full employment yes, um, yes. so I think um, I think there was wisdom there but but um, of course uh, the danger is as you say that um, you know anything any little small downturn, any 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 little um, little uh, small fluctuation becomes the excuse for intervention. Yeah. Whereas in in many cases, you'll just say, "Look, it's not going to be serious. It's a necessary yeah. tonic, if you like, um, of a, a, a way of improving the structure of the economy." We don't do we don't do very much about it. We just let it happen. Yeah. But you've got to be alert then to um, 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 uh, really serious some serious um, uh, downturns, and then you've got to be prepared to go go in, and you can't risk uh, what Hayek was prepared to risk in 1929, 1932. And in fact, they did go in in 2008, 2009. They the, the governments used the big weapons to yes. stop. Oh, yes. Stop the downturn really becoming catastrophic. Yeah. And in some level, you could see what you might call the win win game of not going into a deep depression, but the distributional consequences of who got bailed out and who didn't. Oh, yeah. They have spawned the change of the House of Representatives from Democratic to Republican. Yeah. Eventually, the Senate changed, and eventually, Donald Trump was elected. And what was his. Uh, what I'll call uh, elevator speech, the system is rigged. Yeah. And we, we were, how would I say, uh, at the onset of INET, many people would come to me and they would say, well, this is proven, this 2008 crisis, that unfettered free markets don't work. But what they didn't see was that the faith and trust in government to repair was damaged badly by the nature of the structure of the bailout. And by the way, I don't blame the operatives in the Obama White House because I think the problem was structural. Yeah. I think the power of the financial sector was so great is if you had imposed a great deal of the distributional burden on them, they would have stopped and we would have gone into depression. Yeah. And that's a structural flaw in the nature of American political economy. But I... I uh, the the long term ramifications. I actually often conjecture. I can't say I know this, but I do suggest that the demoralization of American people towards government in two thousand eight is one of the greatest inhibitors of addressing the challenge of climate change now. Uh, I think you may. I think you may be right on that. Um, but I mean, going going back to two thousand eight, two thousand nine, what would Hayek have suggested? Would he have said, "Okay, um, let 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 the, the banking system go bust"? 
Um, that would have been a logical implication of his policy. I mean, it, there was just a whole lot of malinvestment connected with the financial system. Yes, yes. So you, you, and it's not a, a case of a single bank going bust, which is a lender of last resort kind of argument, possibly, uh, or a, letting a single firm collapse. There was a whole in, globally interconnected system, yes. which was <coughs> essentially insolvent by 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. So what would uh, governments have done, should have done, well, I think they were right. They, they had to stop the hemorrhaging yes. of, of, the, of, of yes. the banking system. But beyond that, you see, they then um, uh, went into uh, quantitative easing. And that was the wrong step, in my view. They should have done much more on the fiscal side, because on the fiscal side, you can make a political decision where you want the money to go. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you do it, if you do quantitative easing, uh, and especially the way they did do quantitative easing, um, you, you just increase the assets of yes. people who already have assets right. and therefore increase inequality. And, and if the distribution of wealth is narrow, meaning, yeah, it meaning highly concentrated at the outset, a very small proportion of the population is going to benefit greatly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have a bond buying program, who 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 owns the bonds? That's I right. mean, <laughs> that's right. Um, and um, well, uh, I know uh, Amir Sufi and Atif Mian wrote a book called House of Debt, where what they suggested was that had the bailout structure allowed for very large write downs of underwater mortgages, yeah, therefore the need to write down the creditors of banks and recapitalize banks with our fiscal injection, the distributional consequences would have been much fairer yeah. to what you might call the, the polluters would have paid, the financial yeah, sector yeah. that made the mistake. But the other thing they emphasize is those people whose mortgages were underwater have a much higher propensity to consume than the beneficiaries of quantitative easing. Yeah. And so you would have gotten much more bang for the buck going in that direction. Well, I think uh, I think this uh, this is straight straight out of Keynes, the yes. propensity to consume, but it's not out of Hayek. Mm -hmm. Hayek thinks crises are caused by too much consumption. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, too much financed consumption. Yeah, too but, much this, financed consumption yeah. and not enough saving, you see. And yeah. and so his whole his whole take on this yeah. would have been very very different. Yes, and um, I know uh, your fellow member of the House of Lords and INET senior fellow Adair Turner, yeah. in his book Debt in the Devil, yeah. he said this entire structure of protecting the financial sector is essentially fostering inflation or increase in the price of positional goods. Yeah. high quality real estate which is collateralized mm. it's not feeding the growth of productivity the metaphor people use is that the productive structure of society is facilitated by credit allocation and that the residual in the long term is productivity has gone up and society can afford to pay that debt back and adair suggests that the current what i'll call sectoral allocation of credit doesn't have very much to so, do with productivity. So what's wrong with the argument that, um, uh, with uh, Eugene, Eugene Farmer's argument, that um, you deregulate the financial system and it, it starts allocating capital uh, efficiently at, uh, because the risk, I mean, at, at, at lowest risk, you get a more efficient allocation, and that must be good um, for um, economic growth. Um, it also is non-distortionary. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What's wrong with that argument? Because that was the argument behind the deregulation, um, the theoretical argument behind the deregulation of the banking system yes. and allowing, so to speak, all these things to happen. And it was all done in the name of economic efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think we have to probably understand exactly what was wrong with that argument. Was it that there was a monopoly position in, 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 in the financial sector? Um, or was it that they ignored um, uh, the element of uncertainty and they assumed that risks were properly being judged? Yes. I think there's still an argument about that, in, and in I'm not sure we're sure. In the context of radical uncertainty, your quantitative model based on recent quarters of price behavior or whatever – 
the, yeah. how would I say the, the past is not does not foretell the future. The uh, little metric you give the top management at night so he can go home and sleep well when he's the bank president may have nothing to do with the challenge that's on the horizon in a world of structural flux. Yeah, and, uh, and, and there's also a political element, which is, I think, Hayek would recognize, and there was government government uh, policy to get poor people houses. Yes. And therefore, they encouraged, they encouraged, by certain types of subsidy, they encouraged, actually, the, the housing bubble yes. well, I know, and, uh, and the subprime mortgage uh, collapse Raghu later Rajan on. Rajan wrote a book, uh, about exactly that theme. I guess my experience working in Capitol Hill is that that notion of poor people's housing was less a motive than the ability because of the complex derivatives that were being created. The people who originated mortgages could push these things in for big fees into these, how do you say, packaged derivatives yeah. and the complex derivatives made fees for wall street and things like freddie may and fannie mac fannie may and freddie mac stood behind mm -hmm. basically as the sump to take over the bad loans and that which you might call turbocharged excessive loans and and the other problem of course was a lot of the poor people who got a house got a house for a very short period of time before it was Little. repossessed. Yeah. And they got wiped out of what down payments and little wealth they had. Yeah. So they, uh, I think the noble desire to provide housing for poor people could be accomplished in ways that weren't quite so profitable for Wall Street and were more stable for the broader population. I, I think I agree with that. Of course I agree with that. And, and that's a big argument against um, um, <clears throat> overemphasizing the efficiency of the market yes. because yes. Uh, <clears throat> markets in the long run may be more efficient than, um, to go back to our original discussion, than central planning system. But it, it's what happens in the short run that um, can be absolutely, that can completely wipe out that long run argument. Yes. If, the, if the short run lasts 10 years or 20 years, um, then it, it has effects that actually go uh, forward into the future. Yep. Um, and they contaminate the next 20 or 30 years after that. So you can't distinguish in that easy way between short run and long run as Hayek would have liked to, I think. Well, I think there's a, a real danger right now to follow on from what you just suggested, which is too big to fail banks have shown their political power. They got bailed out. What's the ramification of that afterwards? Their the, what you might call the risk premium related to bankruptcy and their funding costs goes down and concentration, big, large concentrated banks have a funding cost advantage relative to smaller banks. Yeah. Smaller banks can fail. Bigger banks are too big to fail. As a result, more and more capital will go through the bigger banks. Now there's a big argument afoot, which is Things like our lower house in the House of Representatives in the United States and parliaments around the world know the voters are resentful of the financial system. As a result, they won't vote for the bailout, and they'll be like, Hayek, let us go and have that depression. Yeah. We can't afford that. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm of sympathetic to that. But if we can't afford that and we're going to fortify the bailouts, we are exacerbating the cost advantage of the too big to fail banks, and not only will they gain market share, they'll be more aggressive because it's heads they win, tails the taxpayer yeah, loses. Yeah. Our fiscal capacity can be utilized in a very bad way, and what we haven't mastered in the Western world. And my board member and friend Richard Vague has just written a book about this. What we haven't mastered is prior restraint of credit allocation. If you guarantee mm. downstream contingent on mm -hmm. a collapse, you've got to be able to restrain upstream. Otherwise, the bailout you're going to do is going to be even bigger. And what Richard mentions in his book, it's called A Brief History of Doom, is that almost every financial crisis was foreseeable. Mm. And they almost, well, they, in his book, they all emanate from the private sector. 
Yeah, well, I, I'm sure that's true. I think I think crises emanate from the from the private sector. But I mean, what do you then? But what do you do about banking? I mean, there was a. I mean, in the early days of the crisis, I mean, I think actually President Obama said no bank should be allowed to, to own more than a small percentage of the total wealth uh, assets of the of the country. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't get through. I mean, the idea was to uh, make smaller banks smaller. Um, yes. And therefore, you could allow, under those circumstances, a bad bank to fail without um, involving the whole of the banking system. I mean, I think that was the logic behind yep. it. It was an antitrust. It was an antitrust idea. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then, of course, you but you can't do that just in one country. You have a globally inter, inter, interconnected banking yep. system yep. in which capital is flowing fairly freely between different financial centers. Do you try to stop that capital, interrupt it, Tobin tax? Yeah. Or, 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 or even more, um, in order to um, disaggregate the, 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 the financial system yes. and, thus, um, and, and thus lower the risk of, of, of a failure. Or, or uh, of a propagation, or, or, or through, propagation one through one to, others, to the other. Yeah. I mean, that whole um, idea um, of, of, of disaggregation and, and making uh, banks smaller has, has simply disappeared. Yes. I mean, um, uh, it, it was strong in 2009, 2010, then it's vanished. Well, you had mentioned to me earlier in this discussion in passing the role of computers in yeah. replacing the market. And a lot of people that work in the financial sector now tell me that the economies of scale, of having th everything aggregated under one roof, mean that financial, large, complex financial institutions are almost like natural monopolies. That if you break them into 10 pieces, the system is much less stable yeah. and the system is much less, uh, which you might call efficient, uh, uh. than if you allow these increasing returns to scale to be aggregated under one roof. Yeah, but, but, but the side effects are that intertwined nature uh, and the spillovers for society. Uh, but that assumes the computer is an omniscient, you see. I mean, yeah. if suppose, suppose um, the computer made one large mistake, one mistake, yeah. then... Everyone is affected right. by well, the there's, mistake. There's, I mean, there's a, never going to be a mistake. Absolutely. There is a very powerful example of that, which was the derivatives that worked off the Black-Scholes option pricing in the complex mortgage derivatives had every bank using a computer, and they were marking to model. They weren't marking to market. Ah. But because they all had a similar model, they would come up with similar prices until the crisis erupted. And the whiff of bankruptcy risk entered into that, which wasn't specified in that model. And everybody was showing, I'll just pick a number, 93 is the cost of this, what was face value, $100. And they go out in the market, and the market give them 20 <laughs> And so the mark to model collectively yeah. made a mistake. It made a mistake. And, and, and you know, just one, I suppose we, 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 we um, shouldn't go on forever, but um, I, I remember a wonderful um, remark. Um, it was in t partly intended as a joke, but not entirely, by Thomas Sargent, the uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner. And he said, well, what's our ideal? God and the economist in the same model. <laughs> Said that at a public lecture. God yeah. and the economist in the same model. Okay. Well, my my <laughs> retort to that would be, uh, in our conversation today, we've talked about two brilliant men. And there is yin and yang, as the Asians say, in everything. There's good and evil in everything. If God and economists are in the same model, where's the evil? <laughs> Thanks very much. This has been a delightful conversation. Uh, very enjoyable. That was Lord Robert Skidelsky, award-winning economic historian and the author of a dozen books, including most recently, Money and Government, Past and Future of Economics. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.